Uh, go with me to John's Gospel, chapter number 14, verse 15 to 21. We're going to hang out in John, thanks to two young sisters in our church who sent me questions about the, the book of John all week. Y'all shall remain nameless, Marisol and Gloria. <laughs> They're like, we're going through John. Help us understand this passage. And then I get sidetracked because I told y'all I have the attention span like this big. And I start reading. John 14, here's what it says. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Oh, this is good. Can I read that again? You know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. There's Jesus dropping hints again. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Jump two chapters with me, John 16, verse 7, and here's what it says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's some good word right there. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us so clear, so profound, God, that there'll be no doubt in our minds that we have heard from heaven today. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever thought about what life would be like if you had a superpower? Come on now. I'm getting there. Just think about what life would be like. I, 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 I watch some movies, you know, time to time, and I see these superheroes, and they're doing all these incredible things. But every once in a while, in the midst of watching the movie, I just kind of go off in my own little world. I'm like, imagine if I could do that. <laughs> How will the world, and my world in particular, be different if I possessed a super? Power. That's my, my title for today's message, Superpower, Embracing the Holy Spirit Within. And I want every kid in the room to be able to relate to this message as well. And, and as I was talking with our children's ministry director this week about some plans we have for our kids' ministry, one of the things that we were going over was, was our, the language to, that we want to communicate to you all, the heart behind the mission of our children's ministry. And one of the things that came up was that, that all of our kids have the spirit of the Holy, the, have rather the Holy Spirit within them. They don't have a junior Holy Spirit. They don't have a dollar menu Holy Spirit. They don't have a store brand Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit that every other believer has, and he is living inside of them. And because of this, he empowers them to live life in a way that other people can't live without him. And as we're talking about the children and I'm reading through John, I'm like, wait a minute. There isn't a junior Holy Spirit, therefore there isn't a senior Holy Spirit. And all of God's people need to know that if you are a blood-brought, redeemed believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you already have a superpower. I didn't get you. I'm going to try this side over here. If you have Jesus living on the inside of you, you need to understand this, that you have been given a superpower. There is something living in you that gives you the ability to live beyond this world. Okay, that sounds cute, Pastor, but why? I'm still in this flesh, and it's, it's challenging for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, and that's a, precisely why he gave you the power. He gave you the power so that you could overcome everything that's in your flesh. Now, let's talk about what the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit isn't because there's a problem with that within the Christian churches that we don't understand basic fundamental doctrines. 
And because we don't understand who God is, we can't access the power that he is because we don't know what, what he is and, and who he's supposed to be to us. Now, let's, 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 let's establish this from the, found, from the, from the very beginning. Let's, let's lay some foundation. There are many misconceptions about the identity of the Holy Spirit. Some people view the Holy Spirit as some mystical force. Yeah. Others see the Holy Spirit as an impersonal power that God makes available to people who follow Christ. But here's what the Bible declares, and I wish I could sit here for hours and teach through this, but the Bible boldly declares that the Holy Spirit is not some mystical force. He is not some, some, sub, uh, uh, some power that's on the, on the outside of God, but rather the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. I need you to understand it's so important because people say, I got the Holy Spirit like it's something you put in your pocket. Are y'all with me? I, I got the Holy Spirit like it's something you put in your pocket. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is God himself. And, and it's all through the scripture. All through the scripture, we see this, the nature of this triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I know right away everyone's like, well, he's Father, Son, Holy. I'm confused all it. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. It's, real, it's, it's three in one. It's real simple. He is who he is. But he's not separated. Those three distinct purposes are not separate from one another in the sense where they don't make up God. They have separate functions. But there, it's God Almighty. So when I say Jesus, I'm talking about God Almighty, God in flesh. When I make reference to the Father, I understand the Father who's sitting on the throne. All right? Father in all creation. When I, when I make reference to the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about some little aura that sits on the side. No, we're talking about God himself. And I want you to understand that without getting too deep into the weeds there. It's important for you to understand it because I see people trying to access the Holy Spirit like in it's, it's an accessory you buy at Target. And Target had a real bad week, y'all. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not an accessory that goes onto the side. The Holy Spirit is God himself. And that ought to change your mind about when you say, I got the Holy Spirit. Because when you say and make that claim, you are saying the God of the universe is living inside of you. And y'all, that is a powerful statement to make. Can I just say this? I don't like people who live like the devil, who cuss like the devil, and got the nerve to say, I'm filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Did he just say that out loud? You be confusing us. I'm not saying those of us that have the Holy Spirit don't make mistakes and have not cussed before, but we, oh, Jesus, when the Spirit of God is living inside of you, there ought to come some conviction that lives inside of you and also some restraint that gets in your flesh. Am I preaching to the right church this Sunday morning? There ought to be something different about you. Don't you be claiming, listen, this is not the Holy Spirit. That is dancing and dance all you want to dance. Sing in the spirit, dance in the spirit, walk in the spirit, pray in the spirit, all that. But don't you think because you can do this, you got the Holy Spirit. Don't think that you, who help me, help me, Jesus. Help me, give me one of these microphones. Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> don't think because you can speak in an unknown tongue. Oh, Satan can speak in an unknown tongue. I met some folks that can huck a mashanda and then cuss you out right afterwards. Some of y'all like, I know, I know where they're sitting right now. They cussed me out in the parking lot last week. Uh, again, and, and I'm not against those manifestations of the Spirit of God. I'm not against the gifts. I'm going to get there in just a few minutes. But what I want to do is break down some of the myths that, that, are, that have gotten into the church somehow that this is the totality of what the Spirit of God is. And this is why I want to do that because when you don't have a proper understanding of the Holy Spirit, it will make for good church people and bad Christians. It makes for people who don't have character but know how to do church really well. And I don't know about you, we're living in a day where the world doesn't care about our church services. They care about the way we live when we're out there in them streets. And I need the Holy Spirit to help me live. If you believe that, give God 10 seconds of your best praise and worship. Come on. I'm not done yet. 
The Bible also tells us that the Holy Spirit is the divine person. How do we know this? Because we find out that the Holy Spirit has a mind, it has emotions, and it has a will. Read through scripture. So we know it's divine in its nature. We know it's not just something that's cast off on the side. Now, what I want to get into into the bulk of today's message is what does the Holy Spirit do for us? What does the Holy Spirit do for us? Here, 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 let's get into this. Anything of eternal value in your life and eternity comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. Anything of eternal value in your life is coming through the work of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is being accomplished in your life as a believer apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, your salvation started with the Holy Spirit. How many know, I know people had this wonderful story say, I finally came to Jesus. I'm going to say the truth. I didn't come to him. He grabbed me. <laughs> See, I'm going to try this side. The liar's on that side over there. <laughs> How many of you are like me? The Holy Spirit, there might have been a little part of you that wanted to do it, but the reality is the part of you that didn't want to do it was a little stronger than, than the part of you that wanted to do it, but it was like something got a hold of you. We used to sing a song in church, said, I went to church one night, my heart wasn't right, but something got a hold of me. I can't even explain what it was, but I went to church and I heard the gospel being preached, and it was as if God grabbed me. Yes, he did. It was the drawing of the Holy Spirit. He was drawing you into a relationship. Now, why is this so important? This is why we can't take credit for our salvation. This is why we, we should always be excited when we hear the gospel, when we hear about Jesus' blood being shed on our behalf. Why? Because on our best day, we couldn't save ourselves. On my best day, I couldn't save myself. It took Jesus drawing me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, this is critical to your salvation because if you ever get so entitled to think that you somehow, some way, made decision to be where you are, you see, that's what gets us messed up is we start thinking, I chose, and everybody ought to choose like I did. Baby, you didn't choose. He chose you. He grabbed you up out of that place. And when you get that mentality, come on, somebody, you won't be so mean to people that are struggling. Because you can look at them and say, that's where I would be unless Jesus came and grabbed me. Am I talking to anybody right here that can be honest about it? Because there were some days where I wanted to do it, but most days I didn't want to do it. But something got a hold of me. And something is still getting a hold of me. Because if I can tell you the truth, some days I don't want to do it. Some days I wake up and say, I don't feel, oh, I don't want to be the, oh, I got to be nice. I don't want to be nice. I don't want to be faithful. I don't want to be honorable. I don't want to live this way. But something inside of me says, come on, put your feet down on the ground and trust me another day and honor me and live for me. Is there anybody that knows that the only reason you're living for Jesus is because the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and you couldn't do it save he be with you. This is so important because this will, this will keep you from looking down at people. I'm telling you, the more revelation I got about the Holy Spirit, the less, the less judgmental I'm becoming. Because I realized, oh, that wasn't me? You mean I didn't do that? He's like, no, nah, you didn't do that. Honestly, you were about to mess it up. I stepped in. Like, but Lord, I, I was having a good day that day. He says, yeah, you were going to blow it about 3.30. <laughs> about 3.45, that was your max. You were doing good. You had peopled as much as you could people. At 3.45, your supervisor was going to walk into your office and just wear you out. And you were not going to be, somebody, I'm preaching to your Friday. And I'm telling you, the deeper I get into this understanding of the Holy Spirit and his active power in my life, it causes me to realize, oh my, the work of salvation is God's and not mine. He is doing it in me, Alan, not me doing it with him. It's not, he's not an accessory. He's not something I put on for the dead. No, 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 no. He's something living on the inside. And because he's living there, he's leading me and guiding me. And that understanding transforms my mentality. It has me to see that God, that God is doing this work and not myself. Okay, can I get into this? Uh, here, here we go. Here we go. Let's keep going. Uh, if we want to follow Jesus and see that we need, we need help to do so. We need to see that we need help to do so. God gives us the Holy Spirit, and, and, and here's what you need to know about the Holy Spirit. God gives us the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is be willing and obedient to receive what God gives. 
That's what I said. There's no junior Holy Spirit. Can I just say this too? There's no Methodist Holy Spirit. There's no Southern Baptist Holy Spirit. There's no Pentecostal Holy Spirit. There's no Charismatic Holy Spirit. There's no Journey Holy Spirit. There's no Worship Center Holy Spirit. There's no Victory Church Holy Spirit. There is the Holy Spirit that belongs to the blood brought, blood redeemed believers of Jesus Christ. That's only, there's only one. There's only one. And it's important for us to get that because if we don't, we'll start thinking our Holy Spirit is better than your Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit is up there like, y'all, y'all messed this up too. You messed this one up. All right, here we go. God's power is available to us because the Holy Spirit within us. This is not our power. Okay, get that in your spirit. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Okay, so let's talk about superpowers from the Holy Spirit. You say, well, Pastor, you talked about what superpower would I like. I'm going to talk about the ones you have. Here's the first one. Here's what the Holy Spirit does. It's a superpower. The Holy Spirit sanctifies you. Sanctifies you. What? That's like a very theological word. Sanctifies. Yeah, cleans you up, sets you apart. I know you thought you cleaned yourself up because you stopped doing what you did. You didn't stop. You didn't stop on your own. Yes, yes, you participated with God in his plan and you submitted, but ultimately it was the work of the Holy Spirit that accomplished that inside of you. Did you hear me, somebody? The Holy Spirit did that work inside of you and he sanctified you and he's not just setting you apart based on the sins that you committed, but even positionally, he is setting you apart and putting you in his beloved. He is sanctifying you, and that means a, that's a daily work happening inside of you too. How many of you, have, you didn't start off where you are. It took years of the Holy Spirit sanctifying you and making you better. And here's how the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He annoys us with conviction. Can anybody say praise God for conviction? <laughs> conviction is that thing when you know you're about to do something you ain't supposed to do. And that little thing be like, you know you ain't supposed to do that. You know you ain't supposed to be living that way. Conviction is that thing when you went and you started doing it, and while you're doing it, you can't be comfortable doing it. You better praise God for the Holy Spirit that will go with you to places you ain't supposed to be. Anybody got that testimony out there? The Holy Spirit will say, yes, you can run it, but you can't hide, baby. You can't get away from me. You can run here, there, and everywhere, but I'll be right there to remind you that you don't belong here. I'll be right there to remind you that you're saved and sanctified and Holy Spirit filled and there's no reason for you to be in the midst of this sin. I'm preaching to somebody's Friday night. You're in places you ain't supposed to be, and the Holy Spirit won't let you rest. I thank God that he won't let me rest. I remember, see, I'm a church kid, so I've always listened to Christian music even when I was sinning. Some of you church kids know exactly what I'm talking about. See, I grew up, there used to be this, it was like the Backstreet Boys, more like Boys to Men, because I'm not really, bless, God bless the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> I was getting ready to say something, the Holy Spirit was like, would you shut up? <laughs> but it was like the Boys to Men of the church, they were called Commission. How many Commission people out there you know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, Y'all know them as like Fred Hammond, Marvin Sapp, but before they were Fred ha Hammond and Marvin Sapp, they were Commissioned. And commission was like, they were just incredible. And we would like, Christian kids would play commission, y'all. Like that was our music. And I remember being on my way to sin, listening to commission. Don't look, don't, don't you look at me like that. I'm feeling judged in that area right there. <laughs> I'll be driving to sin, and I go in sin. I, I'm not making light of it. I wouldn't be comfortable in sin. I'd get in the car, and you would think that I would try to turn on a radio station that would affirm my sin, but it didn't give me peace. So even when I tried, I had to go back to what gave me peace. And the Holy Spirit was letting me know is I don't care how far you run and hide and what you try to do, you will not be able to shake the fact that I'm living inside of you and that's not the way you're supposed to go. Can we praise God for the fact that the Holy Spirit convicts us? He convicts, come on church, the world don't like that word, but conviction is a gift. A conviction is a superpower. Other people
People are living like the devil and don't care about it. Cuss you out and walk away and smile. But anytime you step out of line, there's something in you says you need to repent. You need to tell that person you're sorry. You better thank God for the superpower of conviction and sanctification that comes through the Spirit of God. Here's the next one. The Holy Spirit helps you do the Father's will. Ooh, this is good because I don't always want to do God's will. As a matter of fact, most times I want to do my will. But God says, listen, I, I love you so much, I know that you don't want to do my will, so I'm going to empower you by my spirit for you to do my will. God made this so simple, y'all. He says, I'm going to tell you what to do, and then I'm going to give you the gift to be able to do it. When you look at it, it's like it's a fixed fight. He's got this all set up for us. All we have to do is surrender to him. So the Holy Spirit, uh, Acts, 20, Acts 8 and 29 is a passage in regards to Philip. It says, then the Spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And I want you just to grab, grab from that is that God himself, the Spirit, will, will speak to you and send you into the place that God is calling you to. Nothing you do in your life, if it's the will of God, you do it apart from the Holy Spirit. Everything that I've been able to do in life that has made a difference in my life and maybe even the lives of others has come as a result of yielding to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, go and do this. Go and do that. Go and do this. And I've walked in that and I've, 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 I've been blessed to be able to see the harvest of blessings, the harvest that comes when you do it God's way. I want to encourage you. The Holy Spirit will not only just tell you what to do, but it'll empower you to be able to do the will of the Father. Here's, here's the next one. I want you to know this. The Holy Spirit gives us the superpower of being a witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when Jesus is, is giving his last message to his disciples just before his ascension, he says that the Holy Spirit's coming. You know that comfort I've been telling you about? He's coming. And when he comes, he's going to fill you with the power that's going to be able to help you become, be my witnesses. After the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will be my witnesses. You're going to be able to share me with the world, not just in word, but with your life. See, being a witness is not simply you going around saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Being a witness is living a life that says, Jesus did this. Living a life that is above, the, above sin. Living a life that is above the, the brokenness of this world. Are you hearing me, someone? The Holy Spirit will give you power to be his witnesses. That's why we need the Holy Spirit in the church because there's a world that's lost and without Jesus and they need, we need to be opening not our, just our mouths but our lives so that people can see the Christ in us and they could see that, that, that he, has a, he has a plan for their lives, that, that, that he sent his son Jesus to die for their sins. All this is necessary for the world but it's a part of the, the superpower package that God gave to us. Here's the next one. Can I give you another one? The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. Ooh, this one is good. You need this superpower because there's so many lies in the world right now. You need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to, to overcome every one of your children. Because what they're being fed every single day, whether they're in school or they're looking on their, 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 their devices, whatever the case may be, there are lies being thrown at them every single moment of the day. And it's going to take them having the ability to discern the difference between a, the truth and a lie. And that comes when the Holy Spirit invades their life. The Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. The Holy Spirit will direct your paths right into truth. You'll be able to discern things without even having all the full knowledge of it. You'll just be saying things like this. That just don't feel right. I don't really know the ins and outs of that, and I might not have the theological uh, acumen and understanding to be able to speak to that issue, but this what I do know. I do know that that don't feel right in my spirit. That right there is not God, and I can sense it because I don't have no peace, and wherever the Holy Spirit leads, there's always peace. It didn't mean there isn't trouble. It just means there's peace in the midst of trouble. There's always peace, and we need our children, kids, kids. Y'all need to be praying, church, for your children to be full of the Holy Spirit. Children to be full. Lord, fill them. Fill them till they overflow so that they can rightfully discern the truth because they're, oh, can I? Y'all saw the news all week long. There is an all-out assault on the innocence of our children. So we just can't be raising children that just have a junior Holy Spirit. We got to raise kids that are equipped by the Spirit of God to be able to discern. Because mom, I don't care how much you try to shelter them, dad, how much you try to shelter them, eventually they're going to come face to face with a devil. 
And we want our kids to be, have the ability to discern the difference between a truth and a lie. We want our kids to be able to at five and six years old say, I don't understand all of it, but I know what I feel. And that right there ain't God. That can't be him. That cannot be him. I know I'm driving that point, but the kids are on my heart. Here's the next one. The Holy Spirit reminds us all about the things that Jesus taught. Did y'all know that it's in Scripture? The Holy Spirit reminds us all the things that Jesus taught. Here it is, John 14, 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. How many of you remember a scripture you were taught in, 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 in the Sunday school class? as a six and seven year old and here you are a full grown adult going through a crisis and the first thing that comes to your mind is something you learned when you was a child and if you thought that was just random no that was the Holy Spirit bringing into your remembrance how many of you are like I don't know exactly where the scripture is but I know it goes like this and it comes to your mind. You remember what Jesus spoke in his word. And I'm telling you, you need the Holy Spirit because every day I need a reminder. Every day I need to remember what Jesus said because there's attacks coming from the left and the right. And we need to be able to, to, to plant our feet in the, in the truth of God's word so we won't be blown this way and blown that way. He'll bring to our remembrance what he's spoken over our lives. The promise of God. Do you know that the promises of God have to be remembered daily? You have to tell yourself, God, I remember what you said. Especially if you've been in a season of waiting for God to, to, to answer a prayer. You better remember what Jesus said. You better remember the word that was spoken to you. You better remember that and keep that in your mind. And, and, and here's the, the superpower of the Holy Spirit is that that's what the Holy Spirit does. It brings to your remembrance. Here we go. Here we go. A little bit church here. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. Supernatural gifts. You ever wonder, like, how does pastor know exactly what to preach to me every Sunday? He doesn't. <laughs> he really doesn't. The Holy Spirit knows. And the Holy Spirit will speak a word to the pastor like he spoke the word to you. And it will minister to your need. And you'll think, this is why we got to be careful not to put leaders and preachers on pedestals. Don't put me on no pedestal. I ain't trying to fall. I know I'm messed up. And you're thinking, oh my God, pastor must have been in deep prayer. Y'all, <laughs> what I preach to you is what I needed. And the hero in this story is not the preacher. The hero in the story is God himself. The Holy Spirit came and ministered to every one of our needs. Let me let me go to let me go to scripture. 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 through 7. Now these are the variety of gifts but the same spirit. They are varieties of service but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities but the same God who empowers them all in in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. The spirit is giving us gifts. But hear what it said. It's for the common good. You don't get a gift of prophecy and then sell it. Chris, come get them now. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm appalled at what I see. And the fact is that people are sending their money to these people. If you, come, if, you, if you call now, you get one free prophecy. I wonder what the cost is for the second one. Oh, come and bring your... Ten I'll pray for you if you have $10,000 seed. $10,000, you get a special prayer. No, no, here's a new one. $20,000, you get prayer and a prophecy. This is the selling of gifts. Now, it doesn't just go with the selling of gifts. Also, some of you, help me, Jesus, this is in the Charismatic and the Pentecostal Church. We dabbled in mysticism. Because y'all running around calling everybody a prophet and treating them like they're Jesus' second cousin. Real prophets don't need a title. Really gifted people don't want recognition. 
The people who have really have a prophetic word for you are the people sitting next to you in church that don't got no name. Nobody knows who they are. They'll never be on TBN. They'll never be on Christian broadcasting. They're just regular old people who love Jesus. But we got so caught up in making 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 these, these rulers. See, Israel always wanted a king when God only wanted a people. And the church is the same way. We want prophets and this person and that person and all these gifts flowing. And we don't even realize God says, I put that in you. That is, there's no junior Holy Ghost. That person don't get that. I put all that in all of y'all. And it's for your common good. You don't get, most of you say, Pastor, do you remember that word that you gave to me? No. <laughs> I know there's some amazing prophets. Oh, I always remember every prophecy because you were writing it before you came to church. I didn't write none of that. Hell, this is getting tight now. Did I, am I messing up Pentecost Sunday? See, I want us to get back to Pentecost. Where it's about the Holy Spirit and not all this other stuff that's going around in the church. Where we're not, oh, help me, Jesus. You see, not everything needs to be a prophecy. Something you just need to go to the Bible and read what the Scripture says. The Holy Spirit will bring into your remembrance what the Lord said. We got people running around, I just need you to prophesy. Prophesy what? Here's the prophecy. Go and be like Jesus. Go and live holy. Go and love your neighbor. All those are prophecies, and they're free. They're all in the book. You can have, am I at the right church? I'm sorry. Am I, am I showing a little aggression and anger? It's not you. It's them. I hear it all the time. Come to the church. Is this a prophetic church? What do you mean by that? I, we, we, yeah, prophecy, yeah. We believe in the Bible prophecy. What do you mean by prophetic? Because you got to be careful because we've turned this into such a mess that what they want to do is come in and say all this crazy stuff. I see 17 dragons and 42. You need to see a therapist. Am I, am I in the book, Sister Judy? That's Pentecost right there. If there was ever a, a person that knows Pentecost, it's her. <laughs> I love her. Full of the Holy Ghost, but not full of all the other shenanigans. Can I just deal with that? Can we get the shenanigans out of the church and get back to the Holy Spirit being the Holy Spirit? On that day of Pentecost, nobody had a product table. Nobody was selling their sermons. Nobody was selling prophecies. It was just the people of God in all of his glory, in all of his presence. How many of you like me just tired of it? Tired. Uh, go. Is this, is this, is this too hard? I, I, I want to fix this. We got to get this right. We got to get this right. Because the world is seeing it and they're calling, they're calling us out on stuff. And then what's happening is it's making them a skeptic about the power of God. That's what makes me mad, y'all. What gets me upset is that God is powerful. He does heal the sick. He does fill you with the Holy Spirit. He does give words of prophecy. He does allow people to speak. He does all those things, but y'all are messing with his work. When's the next prophetic conference? What? It's a whole book of it. 66. Pastor, but, but I see you operate in a gift. I operate in a gift, but I'm not walking around calling myself prophet. There are things that God has given me. We don't make us, hey, 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 God has spoken to me. He has given you the man of God a word. And my kids and wife are like, who is that? I know him for real, for real. God ain't talking to him like that. <laughs> Why am I driving this? Because this stuff is driving people away from Jesus. Now, I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this is the kind of church where we really believe that we, we like to give people um, some, some, some theological leeway. We got people here who maybe come from backgrounds. They believe the gifts have ceased. That means the gifts have ceased. Uh, and you know what? I don't believe my brothers who believe the gifts have ceased and are, are, are going to... To, to, to hell. I, I want to say it in a nice way. I was trying to find Hades. I was trying to figure something out, y'all. I believe they're my brothers and my sisters in Christ. So we, we have open, we're open to that. And then there are people in this room, we believe that the gifts of God are still available. Now people ask, Pastor, what are we, what are we like as a church? Like, I say, well, we try to be, we, we're, we're, we're spirit filled, but we put on a seatbelt. Not because we want to constrain God, but we want to constrain us. Play some real soft. They need it. 
Pastor Hector, our teaching pastor, is like, amen. Because he knows we, we get to hear this stuff. We want to make sure that we don't get in the way of God. Just say, oh, but doesn't, don't you feel like that constrains God? I'm like, listen, I've been in the church my, practically my whole life. And I've never seen God get in the way of himself, but I've seen his people get in the way of him. I've never seen God get in his own way. See, God is too good to get, first of all, he can't get in his own way. But if he could, he's never done it. But I have seen the people of God get in the way and try to create God moments that don't exist. I've seen the manipulation of the spiritual gifts and prophecy to the point where people are being manipulated out of their money. Manipulating the relationships. God told me you should marry this person. I ain't saying that to nobody because I'm not going to be a part of your divorce. I'm telling you right now. I might say, hey, so-and-so's kind of cute. You should go on a date. That's about as far as you're getting from your pastor. I'm, I'm the love connector for about 30 seconds. But I don't believe God be prophesying and saying all these words to you about people. I'm about to lose some people this Sunday. <laughs> I want to say because, hey, why don't we celebrate Pentecost Sunday? We do. We're very much spirit-filled. You know about your pastor? Does your pastor believe in, 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 in speaking in tongues? I do believe in speaking in tongues. Very much I do. I don't believe it's necessary for every believer. That, and I've got friends on both sides of the aisle. Some hate me because of that. Other people are like, okay, I respect that. I've taught this so much in this church, I'll, I'll probably spend the rest of my ministry teaching it. There's extremes everywhere in the church. Extremes everywhere in the church. I believe my assignment as a preacher and a teacher of the Bible is to make sure that we don't get in the way of what God said. There's going to be this freedom for us to interpret certain parts a little differently. But I always want to just be very careful not getting out in front of what God says because here's the thing is anytime in, 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 in biblical history where that took place, it would never end it well for the people who did it. So I'm really content on saying, I'm going to stay back and I'm going to speak where the scripture speaks and I'll be silent where the scripture is silent. And I'll respect that my brothers and sisters enough to say, I agree with you there, disagree with you there, but I don't believe that's a heaven or hell issue. I'll see you in glory. I'll see you in glory. We're not. Do you know that there's not going to be like a special section in heaven? Like the way some people approach these theological issues of the Holy Spirit and what they call pneumatology, you would think that God's going to section us all off and, and, and hide us from each other so we don't think the other people made it. That's not what it's going to be like. As a matter of fact, we're not going to care about these things like we care about them right now. <laughs> When we get there and you actually can embody, oh, Jesus, when you can sit, stand before the throne and you can see the fullness of the Godhead bodily in front of you, the last thing on your mind is going to be pneumatology. Why would you care? You see it. You are beholding him in all of his glory and all of his. Here's the last one. It's actually not the last one, but it is. <laughs> Do you know that the Holy Spirit, when it fell, it did something unique. It did something very unique. It said that there were, there were Jews from all over the world in Jerusalem. They're all over the world. I mean, see, we think that Jews all came from one place, but they were from all over the world. And when the Holy Spirit fell, here's what began to happen. People began to speak in languages that were native to the people who were visiting. And as they were speaking, they were speaking the gospel of Jesus. And it's one of the moments, and I wanted to get to this point... God, help me put this all together. I want to get to this point because it's something we are experiencing as a church. It was all these cultures being stitched together through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the supernatural parts of the Holy Spirit that I think is being missed. And I pray that, we, I pray that churches around the world will begin to experience what's happening right here in this house. Is that beyond our cultural differences... Beyond our, our socioeconomic differences, that the Holy Spirit will come in and He begin to stitch His people together into one, come on, one people, one bride. 
And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, the gospel message started going out in every single language. And it didn't matter who you were and where you came from. God says, I'm here for you. I'm concerned about you. You're on my heart, and I want to minister to your need. And I pray that in this hour, that they, see, that's the Holy Spirit that I'm praying for. It's not that I'm against the, God, the Spirit of God moving and people dancing in the Spirit. Y'all, that is my heritage. That's where I grew up. But there's a part of me that longs for something much deeper than that. There's a part of me that says, can the Holy Spirit come in and deal with the issue of racism? Can the Holy Spirit come in and fuse our hearts together, regardless if we come from the poor neighborhoods or the rich neighbors? I want the kind of Holy Spirit that will lift us up as a people, where we can lift up the name of Jesus, regardless of our differences. That's the Holy Spirit that I'm after. I want a Holy Spirit that allow me to worship with someone who comes from a completely different lifestyle than me, who comes from a neighborhood that I would never have been able to even experience traveling through, let alone living in. I want that kind of Holy Spirit. And that's what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost. It took all these different people and he threaded them together and he says, I'm going to put you together with purpose and I'm not going to, I'm going to stitch you together and you can't unstitch yourselves. Jesus. And for the last several hundred years of church history, we've been unstitching ourselves and putting ourselves in this category and that category. And the Lord's like, my purpose was to bring you together. My purpose was to make sure that there would be a people in the earth who would move. Jesus, help me that there would be a people in the earth who could preach the gospel to every creature, to every person. That was what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost. And somehow over the years, through years and hundreds of years of church history, we started moving further and further away from that initial manifestation. And we started adding to it our own traditions, some good and some bad. But the problem is that our traditions have become our God. The problem is that now we view the Holy Spirit in light of our church background. We view the Holy Spirit in light of our denominational background. But I want to let somebody know the Holy Spirit is too big for that denominational body. The Holy Spirit is too big for what your Sunday school taught you. The Holy Spirit is so big that no one preacher has it all, has all the understanding on it. The Holy Spirit is too big to be captured, to be captured. And if we want to celebrate Pentecost, it's more than a dance. Now you can dance too because I like dancing. And you can shout too because I like dancing. I like shouting. But if we're going to live in the spirit of Pentecost, It's going to be because we're going to be the bride of Christ stitched together with the message of the gospel. The message that says Jesus came. He came to rescue you from your sins. He came because you were dead in your sin. But he came so that he would die in your place and he can make you alive in him. He came but he did, and he died on the cross, but he did not stay. I'm preaching the gospel and I wish I had a few more amens in this house. He didn't stay dead. The Bible tells us that early on Sunday morning, the Christ that they put in the grave got up out of that grave with all power in his hand. Now this is the superpower message. This is the message that we've all been commission to share with the world. That's the Pentecost I want, Pastor Hector. We can disagree about the manifestations of the gifts. We can disagree on whether or not prophecy is still activated. We can disagree on whether or not people should speak in tongues. Should that tongue be interpreted? We can disagree on all those things. But I want to get back to the basics, y'all. We cannot disagree that the Spirit of God came to weave us together, to thread us together. And I'm telling y'all, if anything happens this Pentecost Sunday in the church, I pray that every barrier that separates will be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray that everything that is set up against our unity will come down. Every stronghold, every stronghold in Jesus' name. All right, I'm done. I'm telling you, I know what I'm feeling because the thing that I've been, hmm, you know you need to pray. Where you worry, you need to pray. You know what I've been worried about? I've been worried. My son's not here. Caleb's at another game today. Caleb, y'all had a game yesterday. Who talk about a proud dad? Y'all, y'all pray for me. I might have acted a complete fool. Some of your friends be like, might not believe I'm a man of God. I'm telling you. <laughs> My son Caleb was balling out yesterday, Pastor. After. Balling out. First game, he was at 17 points, n- not a single missed shot. Every shot was flowing. I mean, he was, and I'm like, that's my boy. 
I was so excited. We got to the second half, and I saw his body language change. His arms got like, they were like jello. And in my mind, because how many know your children? I told one of my, another kid's father, we coached together, said, Caleb's going to miss a shot. His first shot he's going to miss. He said, how you know? I said, I see his body language. He's scared about missing. Next shot he put up. Brick. And I was like. <laughs> but I'm that loud dad that screams. Caleb! Try it up. Shake it off! You're all right! He's like, shut up, Dad. <laughs> You're embarrassing me. <laughs> so I, he shakes it off. Misses one more shot after that, goes the rest of the game, scored 27 points that game, y'all. My boy. Oh, I was so proud. He was scared. He was scared of blowing it, right? He was scared of blowing it. And I was thinking about it afterwards as I was driving here to church. You know what's been scaring me? That I'm going to blow this. When I start looking around, seeing how the races are coming together, young and old coming together, and I'm like, Caleb, I'm like, it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. Eventually, something's going to happen. One of these crazy politicians is going to start a fight in my church. This next election cycle, all these thoughts are coming in. Well, see, I'm writing in the book. Y'all know I'm telling the straight up truth. So Y'all thought about it too. <laughs> How are we going to do in November? We going to do all right or you ain't going to be here. <laughs> Did he just say that out loud? Yeah, we're not welcome in that mess. And I was worried about it, worried about it. And as I'm, I'm looking around, worried about it. Who's going to get offended? Who's going to get this? And the Holy Spirit is like, just literally as I'm preaching, it says, don't you, don't you think my thread is strong enough to keep my body together, to keep my people together? And you need to trust that the Holy Spirit, pastor, is more than the thing that empowers you to preach. But you need to trust that I, the Holy Spirit is a keeping power. The Holy Spirit not only keeps the individual, but the Holy Spirit keeps the entire body in church. I just rose this morning to let you know that we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is keeping us individually, but the Holy Spirit is keeping us corporately. And if there was ever an hour in the day where there needed to be a church that was strong enough to stand and proclaim the gospel, it is right now and here is the invitation will you accept your superpower will you accept the fact that the spirit of the living God the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you if that's you stand to your feet and give God the best praise you can give him this morning <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah Come on, it's the thread of the Holy Spirit. Now I speak this over this church and over every church in the country. Racism doesn't have our church. Prejudice doesn't have our church. Come on, y'all. Politics don't have our church. None of those things can separate what God has joined together. We are his people. We have one voice. We have one blood. We have one story, one testimony. And that's the testimony of Jesus Christ.